very punctual people, and uh, we won't have any stragglers, right? So we can go ahead and get started on time. Don't want to waste anybody's time. It's a very precious resource. Um, if you're not familiar with me, my name is Jameson Lopp. Uh, I became fascinated with Bitcoin a number of years ago and started falling down the rabbit hole. Uh, basically started with me forking the Bitcoin core repository, creating something I called Statoshi, where I was basically trying to take a DevOps perspective to a node operation and uh, really just uh, added a bunch of instrumentation into Bitcoin Core itself, added some additional layers of uh, graphing and eye candy, and you can check that out at satoshi.info to see some neat charts of like what's going on on the Bitcoin network and what's going on inside of the nodes that I'm running. And uh, I've been working at BitGo for about three years now and have gotten to the point where I am leading a team of engineers who focus on our low-level infrastructure. And at BitGo, we started off supporting Bitcoin, and then over the years have added support for other assets like uh, Litecoin, Ripple, Ethereum, and then as we'll be seeing in today's talk, some of the different Bitcoin forks that have uh, arisen over the past year. And with the focus on infrastructure, that means I'm mainly doing stuff like running services that index the blockchain data as new transactions and blocks come in and provide APIs for the rest of our developers and our platform to be able to get that data and construct transactions, figure out where the uh, UTXOs are that are spendable, what the balances are. Um, I do stuff with fee estimation, uh, transaction signing, and transaction broadcasting. So if you're not familiar with blockchain forks, um, it's slightly different from the idea of a software fork, but there is a lot of similarities. So with a, a fork, you're basically you're making a copy of software or of blockchain you know, at a certain point in time. And then you take that copy, you start modifying it however you please. So the standard definition for a blockchain fork for technically minded folks is that we've got a couple of different types. You generally hear about hard forks and you hear about soft forks. And a hard fork, as you can kind of see uh, with the uh, sort of circles here on the left, is that um, a soft fork is a constriction of the rules. It, it means the new rule set, all of them are valid under the original rule set. Whereas a hard fork is an expansion of the rule set. So you're adding new rules that were not previously valid. And there are various trade-offs that you get between these two different types of forks. Um, over the past few years, we've seen a number of different groups in the Bitcoin ecosystem rally around each other, you know, trying to get soft forks or hard forks passed. And you could be rallying around certain sets of developers or miners or enterprises or users. And it's interesting to see kind of how the political power and governance structure has uh, been unfolding over the years. So some more trade-offs of what you see between hard forks and soft forks are that hard forks are easier to program from a coding standpoint and they allow you to make pretty drastic protocol changes. Basically anything that you can imagine. The downside is that uh, the, you have to get all of the nodes on the network to change their software to accept these new rules. Otherwise, you end up with a chain split. So with a hard fork example here, um, anyone who does not change the rules or their code that they're running on their nodes, they're going to keep going following the old rule set while the people who have upgraded at the point in time when the fork activates, they fork off and are now on a completely separate network with different rules, and those two networks are, are no longer compatible with each other. Whereas a uh, soft fork, because the new rules are still valid under the old rule set, it's, it, it allows for you to have a more graceful upgrade period. And that means that anyone who is not paying attention or is lazy or just has other things that they're busy with doing, if they don't change their code, they don't upgrade, it's okay because they still remain in consensus with the rest of the network that is uh, working on these new rule sets. And 
in a decentralized ecosystem where nobody really has control over anything, it's a lot different from running like a web software stack where you control all the servers and you just deploy the code and everything is okay. Uh, when you deploy code out onto one of these decentralized networks, very, very difficult to revert problems or roll back or, or make like hasty changes. So you want to be very careful and how you go about uh, making changes to the code, especially the consensus code, because you don't want people to fall out of consensus with each other. And it actually gets a lot more complicated than hard forks and soft forks. We won't go into all the details here. In fact, uh, Paul Stork, uh, who was uh, one of the speakers earlier, uh, he has a very lengthy post where he further categorizes uh, different characteristics of forks. And I think he came up with you know, four or five or six different characteristics. And you can even see over here on the right that Bitcoin itself has had a number of forks over the years. Um, most of them have been soft forks, though some of them are possibly considered hard forks. And in fact, there's a lot of debate over uh, some of them which were hard forks. There was uh, a, a slight emergency back in 2013 where there was actually a low level issue in some of the, the uh, database code that Bitcoin Core was using uh, that caused a chain split. Uh, there's actually a little bit of argument over whether or not that was a hard fork or soft fork. It actually got um, the chain reorganized because people came together and got the miners to basically wipe out the, the inadvertent chain that was created. Um, then a really interesting one though, which you see even, even Paul says is kind of up in the air, is uh, one of the first consensus changes that Satoshi ever made, probably back in 2009, early 2010 at the latest, was uh, changing the consensus rule for what the best chain is from being the longest, AKA the one with the most blocks, to being the one with the most proof of work. And technically, you could say that is a hard fork change because it's, those two rules are not compatible with each other. However, because the longest chain was the chain with the most proof of work on the network, it did not cause a chain split. And most people didn't even notice that this rule uh, got changed unless they were like a developer who was paying really close attention to what was happening. Yep. Whoop. Number seven. So, uh, not exactly. Um, so the way that Bitcoin works with adding new blocks uh, to a given chain is that miners are basically chugging away, trying to create another block that is valid and can be added to the chain. At any given time, miners can always agree to like, go back in time and start creating a new chain fork from a specific point in time. However, the further back in time you go, the more computationally expensive it becomes to do. And the, the only reason that this was able to happen was because people noticed very quickly and it was fixed within a matter of hours. So what happened was you had a, a fork where you had two different sets of miners, you know, different pools were using slightly different software and those pools diverged. And so you had some pools working on fork A, some pools working on fork B. And when the developers got together with the miners and other enterprises at the time, they said, okay, we're going to say that fork A is the correct fork and the other one was a mistake. So all of the miners that were working on fork B were like, okay, we'll stop, we'll give up and no longer work on that and we'll switch back. We re they reverted to the original software and continued on fork A. Well, yeah, that is an interesting property of these blockchains and that's why immutability itself can be kind of a tricky term because it's not so much that there's a guarantee data will never change, but rather there is a mathematically provable expense to changing the data. And the further you go back in time, the more expensive it becomes. Um, and so here's just a, a quick graphic that some folks came up with of what happened last year, where we got the Bitcoin chain, and then we had a fork in August 1st of the Bitcoin cash chain, which uh, later in October, there was another fork of the Bitcoin gold chain, and then Segwit2x, which we actually thought was going to be the first ever contentious hard fork in the Bitcoin ecosystem, ended up getting called off at the last second 
It never happened. Uh, we'll get more into the details there. But as you can see, because this is a permissionless system, anyone who wants to can fork anything at any time if they can get enough people together, enough resources. And so even the Bitcoin Cash chain, there was another fork where they changed their difficulty adjustment algorithm and some people remained on the original uh, Bitcoin Cash fork and called, called that Bitcoin Classic. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not sure if that fork is still going. I haven't checked in on it lately. Um, but even if it's not, uh, there was another fork of Bitcoin Cash that a mining pool called ViaBTC announced recently, and they're calling it Bitcoin Candy. Uh, I don't know like, what the properties are of that or why anybody would be interested in it, but this just sort of goes to show the permissionless nature of the ecosystem. It can get pretty crazy. How crazy can it get? Hmm. It has been speculated that in 2018, as many as 50 Bitcoin forks may happen. And this seems pretty crazy, but from my perspective, being in this ecosystem for so many years, this is history repeating itself. If you were paying attention to Bitcoin in the 2012-2013 era, there was uh, something called the kind of altcoin craze at the time, where uh, we had uh, Litecoin got really interesting and popular, and then a number of other uh, software forks of Bitcoin popping up out of nowhere. Um, I can't even remember all of them. There's like a peer coin uh, and uh, name coin was one of the first ones. And it kind of ballooned because it became very, very easy to create these forks. And so some of the parallels that I'm seeing from uh, you know, four or five years ago and what seems to be happening today is that the first few of these things that come out, they're very novel, uh, they're, they manage to capture fair amount of interest from various groups, and they're able to create utility, create value, and you know, have a decent amount of trading on the markets, and probably have some staying uh, power. But very quickly what happens is that those, those first few um, networks that show up grab a lot of the attention, and it becomes harder and harder for, for these new folks to differentiate themselves, to get very much attention from people, to gain traction in the markets, and you end up with a very long tail distribution in the markets of a bunch of shit coins, is basically what we, we generally call them, because they have no interesting utility or value. And so the same thing is going to happen here. Um, at BitGo, we added support for Bitcoin Cash, and we were tentative about adding support for Bitcoin Gold, but we did because we had some clients with a lot of money that really wanted to access it. But I do not see us adding support for probably any of the other ones on here, unless something really unique happens and one of them manages to like shoot up in the, uh, the rankings on the uh, coin market caps. So this is you know, permissionless innovation. It becomes uh, easier for people to create these because uh, new tools come out to get easier. So one of the reasons those first few altcoins in 2012 and 2013 got a lot of traction was you had to be a hardcore developer to be able to create a new genesis block and create new protocol and bootstrap a network. Um, but then by the time we got to 2014 or so, because uh, Matt Corral who was a Bitcoin core developer and went on to found Blockstream, he created a tool called CoinGen.io. And he literally made a web form where you just fill out a few parameters and click go. And it would create your, your executable binaries and, uh, and all of your bootstrapping materials in a nice, easy to use package that you could then just put on your website. Anybody could download their node network. And so by the time it got to be that easy, there's really nothing interesting about it anymore. And that same phenomenon happened here, where actually within a couple of months of the Bitcoin Cash fork, maybe even before the Bitcoin Gold fork, somebody created a uh, coin blockchain uh, fork generating tool. I think it's called ForkGen, probably the same type of thing. And so now anybody can go to this website, fill out a form, now you've got an altcoin airdrop. 
So not really interesting because you're, you're, you're not doing anything, anything unique or adding much value to the system. So here we can see that there are a number of issues from a user perspective with these forks uh, that you know, popped up because we've never seen anything like it before. Uh, one of them is replay protection. And what that means is that you, if you have uh, Bitcoin A and Bitcoin B and you're making a transaction on Bitcoin A, you don't want that transaction to also happen on Bitcoin B and spend your money twice. And of course, multiply that by however many forks are out there and, and that gets even worse and worse. And it can become even worse if the you know, price difference between the two is like 10x and you're spending one Bitcoin B, but Bitcoin A is worth 10, 10x more, and so now you've spent like 11 the original amount that you wanted to, to transfer. So replay protection basically means um, making these transactions incompatible across the different networks. And there are different types of replay protection, uh, which are generally classified as a strong two-way replay protection, which means there's no way for a transaction on one network to get to the other. And then there's a one-way opt-in replay protection where you have to go to a little bit of extra effort to change something about the transaction on one network to make sure it gets rejected on the second network. And then, of course, there's no re replay protection at all, which is a complete nightmare for wallet developers such as myself. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So address format compatibility became a big issue. Now, uh, at BitGo, we had seen a little bit of this uh, early last year, and that was primarily when we added Litecoin support. And we quickly found that um, Litecoin did not change their address format for P2SH, which is the multi-signature version of addresses, which uh, BitGo is a multi-signature wallet. So basically what happened was if you create a multi-sig address on Litecoin, then you get something that looks like this. If you create a multi-sig address on Bitcoin, you get something that looks like this. Can you tell the difference? Neither can wallet software. So what happens is that naive users who aren't paying attention to what they're doing uh, get out their Litecoin wallet and then are pointing it at a Bitcoin address send the Litecoin to a Bitcoin address, and the recipient uh, never gets it. And this results in not completely lost money, because you know, there's somebody who has a private key somewhere that can enable you to access it, but uh, the recipient wallet is not looking for incoming funds on that blockchain. They sent it on the completely wrong network. And this uh, has become a real bane for us, especially when Bitcoin uh, forked into Bitcoin Cash. Because now you also have brand confusion on top of this uh, format compa compatibility problem. And you have uh, people sending their Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash wallets and sending their Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin wallets. And port tickets go through the roof. You start getting all of these issues of people saying, why did my money never arrive? Or, I sent my money and the seller says he never got it. Now he's claiming that I'm defrauding him. And just a lot of people get really upset. And um, this is why it's, from my perspective, very important that whenever you're creating a new network, you also try to break uh, this address format so that you don't have different wallets uh, trying to speak to each other. And then, as we already said, there's the, the brand confusion and that. That comes into play with uh, you know, sending uh, address format compatibility issues, but also just uh, general like talking to other people and trying to do transactions uh, creates problems because some people might go into a service and they, they see two different Bitcoins and, and one of them is a lot cheaper than the other one. And so they're just like, oh, I'll buy the, the cheaper one because it looks like a better deal. Uh, so just naive users uh, can create a number of issues. From the developer standpoint and business standpoint, we have to worry about replay protection, as we said, mainly because it creates a lot of support load. But we also have to deal with something called wipeout protection. And that basically means that you're ensuring that when this fork happens, 
that there's no way for the fork to get uh, reorganized by the miners. Like what we were talking about earlier, the way that that 2013 database bug got fixed, where the miners just agreed to, to stop working on the chain and, and work more on the original one. It is possible, if you're not careful, that you have two chains that are using the same type of proof of work consensus, and if one of them gets ahead of the other one, then the, the minority can actually get overwritten and reorganized by um, the original fork software. Um, this was a potential issue with the Segwit2x fork, but they did end up adding wipeout protection. Uh, they did that by requiring that the fork, uh, the block at the fork height be greater than one megabyte, which was a you know completely breaking rule that the old clients would say, no, that's invalid, we'll never be able to reorganize the chain. Um, but the main reason for this is that if you have services like exchanges, or really anyone who is accepting money on this new fork, if there's any wipeout risk, that means that there's always in the back of your head some semblance of doubt that all the money you've ever received on that fork could just disappear in a puff of smoke. And most people do not want to have that type of doubt. Uh, so we talked a fair amount about addresses and, and, and wrong chain deposits. Uh, that mainly results in a lot of the support tickets and then additional developer workload because you have to build new tools to uh, import the private keys from one chain to another chain, uh, from one wallet to another wallet, and uh, get that money to uh, basically be recovered. Then... Uh, on a kind of related note with that, when you have two forks that are using the same type of addresses and you're generating new addresses in your wallet, uh, we've also found that you can, you can help prevent some of those needs for manual recovery if you're keeping all of the addresses in the wallets in sync with each other. So if, if someone creates a new address on the Bitcoin wallet, you then mirror that over to create a new address on the Bitcoin Cash wallet or what have you. Uh, and that way the Bitcoin Cash wallet is looking for new addresses or new deposits that are received on there. And there's even more of uh, this like resource cost and uh, almost a moral or philosophical question from a business standpoint of how do we determine which of these assets should be added? And the naive answer is, oh, well, you just add whichever ones have a lot of market value, right? Well, this becomes a dilemma, especially for services such as BitGo, where we're, we're not a consumer-facing wallet, we are an enterprise wallet. So we are actually powering a lot of the exchanges. We're powering the marketplaces that are deciding whether or not these things are worth adding support for. It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem there. And so um, we, we still don't, I have not seen any real standardization in the community to decide you know, how does anybody know whether or not this uh, fork or that fork is actually worth the effort. Uh, what I would like to see is uh, a standard built around futures markets. And we have seen a fair amount of activity in futures markets uh, related to these forks. I know like Bitfenix and maybe Bittrex and some of the other big exchanges had futures markets for these different forks. And some people made a lot of money, some people lost a lot of money on them. Um, the main reason I think that they haven't been used for these business decisions is that there was still a lot of question around whether or not the futures were accurate, whether they were manipulated, whether they had sufficient volume, whatever. Um, but once again, I think you know, uh, Paul Stortz's talk that he gave in this room a couple hours ago about prediction markets, that could potentially uh, come into play as well. Uh, especially if his, uh, his like, truth coin hive mind project ends up going into production use and, and gaining sufficient reputation, maybe we can use projects like that to help uh, standardize these decisions. Um, finally, uh, from the sort of moral responsibility question, what happens when, when you, you fork an asset and anyone who owns Bitcoin at that time now has this new asset as well, which may or may not have some value on the market, if it has any non-negligible value, you're going to have customers coming to you saying, 
I demand access to my money. You can't withhold your money from me. Um, this becomes a, a possibly legal dilemma, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, thankfully, BitGo has a bit of an out in this situation because we are non-custodial. So we can always tell a customer, hey, you have enough of your private key data that you can go build your own software or pay somebody else to build the software if you really want to access that value. However, for a lot of the other companies in this space, your custodial uh, exchanges and brokerages like uh, Coinbase and Bitfenix and Bitstamp and Kraken and whatnot, um, they're just holding on to it and they have to make a much even you know, a tougher call than, than BitGo has to make because for every asset that they're not adding support for, uh, you could potentially make a like moral argument that they're, they're stealing money from people or withholding money from people. Um, we won't get too deep into the weeds on that. Um, as far as I know, or at least I'm not aware of any lawsuits around it, but there were definitely a lot of lawsuits threatened against some of these custodial providers um, for, for not making the new assets accessible. So from the infrastructure standpoint, you know, every web service has many, many layers uh, of hardware and software in its infrastructure. And when we're having to add support for a fork, uh, we have to touch every layer of our infrastructure. At BitGo, we have SDKs that our, our clients run on their own servers to do transaction creation and signing. Um, so we have to add support for, for all of that for each new asset. Uh, we then have to you know, also add new API calls on our web servers that can recognize the different types of assets. We have, on the key management standpoint, well, we have to copy over all of the private keys at that certain point in time and associate them with the new assets. We also have to support new uh, formats of transaction signing on our uh, hardware security modules. And then finally, uh, the, the tricky part that I have to deal with is actually spooling up entire new indexing infrastructure that is keeping track of the address balances and the unspent transaction outputs so that we actually know what can you spend on this given chain. And that takes uh, a fair amount of time. You know, the first one took a lot of time with uh, Bitcoin Cash. The second one with Bitcoin Gold took a little less time, but we're finding that we're, you know, increasing the complexity of our infrastructure and once you add support for one of these, you know, you've basically uh, made a promise to, to support that for the foreseeable future. So our infrastructure complexity has really ballooned in size over the past six months or so. And I've ended up having to spend a lot more of my time just doing operational uh, management, keeping all of the services running smoothly. Uh, that has definitely slowed down our pace of development and innovation because we're more worried about just keeping all the servers from catching on fire. So. To get more specific about like, some of these different forks and their unique uh, aspects, uh, Bitcoin Cash was interesting because it was actually announced, I want to say in June or so. Um, I was in the Netherlands at the conference where it was announced. But when it was announced, it was announced as a backup plan in case Segwit2x fell through. But then, and I believe it was on July 22nd, uh, the Bitcoin ABC developers just came out and said, you know what, we're going to do it in a couple weeks on August 1st. That was a big surprise and disrupted our development plans because we knew Segregated Witness was about to get activated on Bitcoin and we were planning on getting that ready so that people could use it as soon as it was available. Instead, we had to pivot uh, and basically it was all hands on deck trying to spool up new infrastructure and add all the support for a Bitcoin Cash. Um, we then, of course, uh, very quickly found out about the address format issues when, when our users started complaining that their money was going missing, even though it was still there, it was just on a different blockchain. Um, we already had experience with this because of the Litecoin issue that I mentioned earlier, but then there was an additional wrinkle. Uh, so, Three or four weeks after uh, Bitcoin Cash came out, we then uh, released our segregated witness uh, compatibility 
and our users started doing SegWit uh, address creation and sending money to SegWit addresses. Well, it wasn't long after that that we had uh, some users start sending Bitcoin Cash to Bitcoin SegWit addresses. This posed a particularly unique problem because Bitcoin Cash does not understand the segregated witness functionality. Um, if you send to a segregated witness address on Bitcoin Cash, you can't spend from it. Uh, it becomes essentially a black hole because if you try to spend using the SegWit rules, the Bitcoin Cash network rejects it. Now, it is possible to recover this money, and we have recovered some people's money, but it requires direct uh, involvement of a miner. You have to carefully craft the transaction, send it to a miner. The miner has to directly include it in a block. But not only that, but once you send the transaction to the miner, you're actually trusting them because they could just steal all the money from you. And this is because on the Bitcoin Cash Network, uh, segregated witness output is seen as an anyone can spend. So they can just take that output and uh, send it to themselves if they want to. Uh, thankfully, our recoveries so far have gone through just fine. But there was at least one incident on the Bitcoin Cash network where uh, some miner was going around and just scooping up all of the money out of SegWit addresses and kind of ransoming it and saying, you know, I'll give you your money back, but I'm only going to give you like 70% of it. Um, not sure how well that, that ended for, for those people. Um, also, uh, Bitcoin Cash actually ended up uh, affecting Bitcoin because Bitcoin Cash had this new difficulty adjustment algorithm that it incentivized a lot of miners to swoop in and mine Bitcoin Cash at certain times because it became insanely profitable to do so. And uh, that actually resulted in the inflation rate of Bitcoin Cash for a couple of months to shoot through the roof. They were creating blocks every 30 seconds to 60 seconds rather than every 10 minutes during some of those periods. And that actually resulted in uh, bigger backlogs on the Bitcoin network. Uh, our, our fee estimates went crazy during those times. Then Bitcoin Gold. Um, it didn't have as many issues, but the first time that I tried to spool up our nodes on the Bitcoin Gold network, nothing happened. They didn't download a single block. And after doing a little bit of investigation, I realized that it, they were not finding any peers to connect to. And normally, a, a node on Bitcoin has a, a fairly complex bootstrapping process for the very first time you ever turn it on. Uh, it, it uses something called DNS seeds, where there are people out on the network, uh, developers uh, really, who are running uh, DNS servers that return lists of IP addresses for uh, well-known, like, well-connected nodes. Uh, the Bitcoin Gold developers forgot to do that part. So what I ended up, and this might have changed since then, but at that time, uh, the only way I was able to fix this was I had to go onto the Bitcoin Talk forums for the announcement page for Bitcoin Gold and find lists of IP addresses of people who were running nodes and manually copy and paste those into the configuration files. Um, and then it worked after that point. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, Bitcoin Gold was good in the fact that they changed their address formats. So we did not have the same type of cross-chain sending issues that we had with Bitcoin Cash. However, this actually caused additional complexity for our infrastructure because when, when they changed the address formats, they did it retroactively for every address that was on the network. So when we were querying our node to, to sync it up to uh, get all of the historical transactions and deposits into these mirrored wallets uh, for like the older Bitcoin history, it was returning addresses uh, to us that were starting with like a Q uh, rather than a three. Um, and so basically, those were not the addresses that we were looking for from our original database. So we had to change our migration of all of these uh, chain addresses to actually copy them over, but also change the format so that then when we were doing that initial sync to figure out you know, what the balance of, of the wallets were, they were actually able to find the right addresses. 
And then Segwit2x was probably one of the most fun of all, uh, both from a technical standpoint and uh, just human standpoint, um, mainly because they were intentionally trying to become Bitcoin and you know, take over Bitcoin, kill the old Bitcoin, we're the new Bitcoin. Um, so as a result, they refused to do uh, strong replay protection. They did have some opt-in replay protection for a couple of days, but it was actually so terrible that I was protesting against it because it would have resulted in a lot of spam on the Bitcoin network. Uh, they then removed that and said, you know what, no re re replay protection whatsoever. So as a result, we had to spend a lot of engineering time at BitGo saying, okay, how can we allow our users to safely use Segwit2x without also spending their uh, regular Bitcoin money? And uh, really what we ended up having to do was adding logic that tagged every single unspent transaction output um, on each fork as being protected against being replayed on the other forks. And then we would propagate that flag through all the like grandchild uh, transactions because uh, UTXO sets kind of like fan out over time. Um, now the idea here being that um, at the time of the fork, BitGo, we, we, we have our own company wallet, we were planning on trying to double spend our own money across these two different forks using various uh, protocol features that already existed such as uh, in lock time and RBF, but basically using features that would allow us to make a transaction on one fork that was not valid on the other. And, and once one of those got confirmed, we would then be able to go into the database and say, okay, this is now safe, or these outputs are safe. You can't spin them on the other network because they don't exist on the other network. And then once we have this like taint pool of unspent transaction outputs, we can then start to insert them into all of our other clients' transactions. So whenever uh, one of our users would want to make a transaction, they would select their UTXOs. If none of them had that protection flag, we would then just shove one of our own in there. And then from that point on, all of the rest of the descendants of those transactions would be protected. And of course, this is not simple. Thankfully, we never actually had to, to try it out in production. Um, but there's a somewhat unanswered question that is still unanswered, and that is like, how do you determine which fork wins in a situation where a new fork is contentious and is claiming that it's going to become the real Bitcoin? Uh, we argued amongst ourselves for many hours about different metrics to use, like hash rate or exchange rate or, or uh, the number of people on Twitter yelling about it. Um, but my ultimate conclusion was that any metrics could be gamed, at least in the short term. And especially if we announced to the world that we were going to be making a decision on any metrics, we could be damn sure that those metrics were going to get gamed by people possibly on both sides uh, who were you know, then going to be competing to be the real Bitcoin. So we figured that the only responsible way to go forward was to go with our gut and that would have to be after waiting for a sufficient period of time. Uh, you know, even a few days might not be enough. Uh, I was thinking possibly in the time frame of weeks uh, because it is completely possible for miners or other entities on the network to be irrational for short to medium uh, periods of time. But um, the main thing that I was trying to impress upon the rest of the people at the company is that you know, if kind of the fundamental aspects of the network were not sane, then something was wrong and we should leave it at status quo. And what I mean by that is um, there's a lot of arguments, there's always been an argument about like whether price follows hash rate or hash rate follows price. It doesn't really matter. In the long term, hash rate and price should be generally in sync. And so, my, my argument was that you know, if the mining hash rate is not generally in sync with the exchange rate, then something's fishy and we can probably uh, make a pretty good bet that somebody is out there screwing around with the network and we should not uh, make any rash changes. 
So a few best practices for protocol devs who want to do one of these altcoin airdrops. Uh, just various technical things. Generally, the idea here is that you want to hit every possible aspect of the protocol to make sure you get a nice, clean split from the old network. You don't want any of the nodes on the old network talking to the new network. You don't want people sending uh, from addresses on the old network to the new network. Um, and you want to make sure that your fork doesn't disappear into thin air. And you want to make sure that, of course, the network can get up and running without requiring a complicated configuration. And you, you want all of this to be done in a transparent fashion. You don't want to surprise anybody. When you surprise developers, uh, they can get a little bit uh, angry because we do not like having additional workloads you know, thrown at us that, that push all of the rest of our, our plans back. So the, the main thing, I guess, to, to come across is that these are permissionless systems. Anybody can do whatever they want. I can't prevent anybody from doing really stupid stuff. We've seen a lot of really stupid stuff happen. Um, and I can assure you that even more stupid stuff is going to continue to happen. So the really all we can do is nicely ask for, uh, for certain uh, standards and procedures to be followed. And if people don't want to follow them, we can ignore them. Uh, that is kind of the, the most powerful aspect of these systems is the power of, um, of saying no or saying nothing at all. Uh, a lot of people you know, get really angry and argue at each other and, and, and try to be aggressive. But these networks are so like, defensive focused that generally doing nothing is the strongest uh, action that you can take. So you know, th there were even some other interesting things going on. Like there was a fork called uh, United Bitcoin recently that I was particularly unhappy with because they're actually confiscating all of the coins from quote unquote inactive addresses, like Satoshi's addresses. And then they're redistributing these coins to the developers of United Bitcoin. I think that's kind of shady. I also think it's kind of shady that, that they were requiring anyone who wanted to claim the money on the fork to have to move their money within uh, a few weeks of the fork happening. That is a huge privacy problem. Um, so. I am not touching any coins on uh, the United Bitcoin fork. Um, you could even complain about the Bitcoin gold fork if you're not aware. Uh, those developers instamined 8,000 blocks and have paid themselves 100,000 Bitcoin gold tokens. So you might have a problem with that. Or you might think that's an interesting way to fuel the development of Bitcoin gold and its protocol. Um, also, uh, as I slightly mentioned earlier, you can do replay protection in really stupid ways. Uh, for example, Segwit2x was proposing having a, a specific well-known address uh, be this opt-in replay protection where if you add an output to that address, then uh, it would not get replayed. Uh, if you did that on the Bitcoin network, it would not get replayed on the Segwit2x network. Um, however, the private key to this address was well known, and the claim was that miners would just scoop up that dust as fees. But I'm quite sure that if that had happened, that everybody on the network who knew how would be trying to collect that money, and they'd be spamming the network with transactions trying to get their free dust. A little extra credit, and some of these may be terrible ideas. I haven't really uh, vetted them. but. Um, the thing about doing a hard fork is you have a lot of leeway. You can change anything you want to. So why are people going to all the trouble of doing a hard fork and just changing the block size? We can do so many uh, better things. There are, in fact, an entire list of improvements on this wiki page that people have been adding to for five or six years now. Um, also, I question you know, whether or not you really want to make a direct copy of the now nine-year-old Bitcoin blockchain, which is like 160 gigabytes and 50 million UTXOs, when you could easily uh, run some scripts to clean up the UTXO set, consolidate it down significantly, um, and, and even get rid of the nine years of blockchain history. I mean, 
what we're doing with a lot of these hard forks is they're just using them as a new distribution scheme for new crypto assets. So why do you need that entire history if we all agree we're just gonna take a snapshot at a certain point in time? Well, just take the snapshot of the UTXO set, start a new Genesis block that has that UTXO set. Uh, this is actually uh, kind of how Ethereum worked. Um, if you look at the Genesis block in Ethereum, there's something like 10,000 addresses in there with various values that correspond to the people who participated in uh, the Ethereum ICO way back in the day. So that's uh, most of the stuff of what I've got for you. We'll end on a little philosophy here. But uh, happy to take questions. Yes? It's anarchy. Anarchy, I tell you. So what do we have to go through? We have to go through Yeah, um, a lot of it does come down to marketing, um, but there's also uh, a fascinating sociological experiment that is going on with these networks. And so the reason why Bitcoin Cash is so successful is because it has a three plus year long history of a certain group of people who are like minded in their view of how to move the Bitcoin protocol forward. These people have become incredibly frustrated over the years and, and are feeling disenfranchised and they don't like the way that Bitcoin has been changing from a user experience standpoint. And so um, I mentioned, you know, I was at the Future of Bitcoin conference in the Netherlands early last year, and, uh, and this was a conference that was primarily you know, focused around people of that mindset, and, and that's where um, Bitcoin ABC was actually announced as an implementation. So they have you know, a large mind share and, and you know, pretty significant amount of, of Bitcoin investors and enthusiasts um, spread across the entire ecosystem. So, so they were able to get sufficient traction and convince sufficient mining hash power. Uh, really like Bitmain was one of the primary drivers behind Bitcoin ABC. And so eventually, you know, after several years of frustration, they were like, you know what? The protocol allows us to fork off and so we're gonna do it. And um, you know, there was, I guess, probably a lot of trepidation to doing that. But then once they did it and showed that it could be done, then you saw this whole onslaught of other people who were like, oh, me too, me too. Um, and, and so Bitcoin Cash, of course, being much more interesting than most of these other copycats. But yeah, the, the sociological aspect is amazing. That's why I'm very active on Twitter. Uh, I think that there's a lot of interesting interaction going on there. And then there are many other you know, forums and social media sites. And um, I talk often about like, what is Bitcoin? And um, I have an article on Coindesk from a year ago entitled Nobody Understands Bitcoin and That's Okay. I highly recommend everybody read that because that's a, both a historical and sort of philosophical deep dive into the organic creation of this thing. But, while I'm very technical and I talk about code a lot, the underpinning of these systems is not code. It's not hardware, it's people. And we're just writing code to describe how we see the world and how we want to create a new financial system. So anybody uh, who has a you know, specific ideology or viewpoint of what they want money to be or what they want any of these permissionless systems to be, all they have to do is get enough other like-minded people together and find the ones that have the skill set to write the code in a secure manner, find the people to run the nodes, find the people to secure it with hash power or some other consensus mechanism, and you've got a network. And now you've got a network, all you need to do is grow the network and grow it and grow it and, until you hit your saturation point. Yes? Or 
Yeah, so it's a little bit of both. Um, I have sold some of my fork coins, um, but A, there's a lot of these fork coins that are actually going to be straight up scams and are just going to try to steal your private keys. So you have to be very careful about how you try to claim your fork coins. I personally would not recommend trying to claim fork coins using anything other than uh, like a well-known hardware vendor that has added support for transaction signing. And even then, yeah, yeah, uh, you, well, you're taking the risk. If you're, if you're just downloading their node software and, yeah, and putting your private keys into it, you're, unless you did a full audit of their software, you're taking a risk that they might just be stealing your keys and then steal all your Bitcoins as well. But also, if you are going to do that, you can be a little more careful and move your Bitcoins to a new address that's, you know, under a different private key. Um, but, like, personally, I think that the vast majority of these things are going to go to zero, and so it probably might, it might be worth your time doing it. But um, even just from an exchange rate standpoint, um, I think I, I claimed my Bitcoin Cash and my Bitcoin Gold, but all the other ones after that, it's like less than 1% dividend. And when we're talking about crypto assets that move 10% every day, uh, me going to the trouble of like getting cold storage out and doing all that stuff just for like 0.01%. Yes? Okay, so a long time we're going to be on this, so pardon me, but you're requesting to be done. But when I had my big Yeah, uh, well, Bitcoin Gold forked off of Bitcoin. Okay. But if you had that Bitcoin on October 20 something, then yes. Uh, so, and that, I guess, what you're talking about claiming it. Yeah, so you're talking yeah, so, uh, btcdiv.com is a pretty good resource for like figuring out how to claim all these things. Okay. But I guess that, that pretty much does it for me. But uh, you can catch me later. I'll be here for at least a few more hours. <laughs>